Sorbo Show. Last week, President Obama said ISIS was contained. Was he right when he said that? We are prepared to defeat ISIS by any definition. The president has engaged with more than 65 other countries to defeat ISIS. The president knows better than any of us the threat that they pose to the security of the world and to the American people. So I have confidence in the president's uh, take on what is out there. So then the question is, what are we waiting for? If we are prepared to defeat ISIS, why are we not doing so? What? That's Nancy Pelosi. She says she has confidence in the president's take that ISIS is contained. She, This woman is more than a useful idiot. She will say literally anything. S- similar to the pro- the president will say literally anything. Welcome back to the show. I'm joined by Diana West, who is the author of American Betrayal. And uh, I want to ask you, Diana, the president said last week that ISIS was contained. And, and I, I conjecture that he pulled contained literally out of thin air. There is, he has no, he has no evidence that ISIS is contained. No, no security briefings, no intelligence briefings to indicate that ISIS is contained. He just wanted to say it. And by saying it, somehow he believes he makes it so. Yes, well, this is, this is the imposition of narrative. This is the imposition of lies on the American public, on the world population, to indicate some sort of mindset in the White House that is completely divorced from reality. He also said that the Syrian refugees were um, a mass of widows and orphans, which we know for a fact is not the case. They are majority Muslim men, not even Muslim majority Syrian, who are mainly of military age. Um, so this this is just... You can't expect reality or, yeah. law or, or honesty coming from the White House. But I would say that, that the focus on ISIS as the, pro, as the threat to American security, American perpetuating America, perpetuating a constitutional republic, is also ignoring a larger problem, which is the problem of Islam, in terms of Islam expanding into the West and bringing with it Sharia norms, which are absolutely antithetical to Western norms and will swallow them up. I mean, this is a demographic movement. The terrorism, to me, the terrorism are, are you know, so-called kinetic events, incidents that grab our attention and, frankly, take away any kind of focus and debate and serious conjecture about long-term Islamic immigration, not ISIS immigration, not even Syrian refugees, but the problem of Islam entering the West in numbers that will demographically, democratically transform the West. So ISIS is just another brand name, another bright, shiny object. We used to talk about al-Qaeda. The problem continues. It remains unaddressed. And I would say across the political spectrum, across the, from right To left, no one will talk about Islam. And when the right huffs and puffs about radical Islam, they are frankly using the same tools of political correctness to avoid discussing Islam that the president is when he will not even utter the phrase radical Islam. Because the problem is not something exceptional about Islam. The problem is the contrast, the contradictions, the gulf between Islam and the West. Okay, we just celebrated the anniversary of our normalizing relations with the communist Soviet bloc. Uh, and I can never get the date right. I think it was November 17th, but you know. Um, November 16th. And yes, thank you. 16th. Happy, not happy anniversary. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and in fact, I was, I was just making the comment that, um, we've got a whole new set of useful idiots today, only these useful idiots blow themselves up. It used to be you could be a useful idiot just by pledging uh, your your allegiance to communism. Now you have to blow yourself up in order to prove anything. But I think I think what you're getting at is, you know, we normalized our relations with Cuba, with Cuba, with communism and yeah. said, well, communism is just a different way of doing things and it's welcome here and we're welcome. We can certainly do trading and uh, business with these people, which we should never be doing business with them if we really exactly. espouse yeah. the ideas that this country stands for. And and so it's the same thing you're saying basically with Islam, because Islam is a political as well as a religious uh, sort of movement. 
as well as illegal. You know, Islam is, is kind of one-stop yeah. shopping for totalitarian life. It is public. It is public life that Islam dictates, according to the Sharia, and it is private life. And the other point that I would like to add about what Islam is, and this is something that Noni Darwish, who is an ex-Muslim from Egypt, who has written very eloquently on this in a couple of books, she was speaking about the fact that within, and she grew up in Egypt, she left as an adult, she was talking about how within Islamic world, terrorism, terror, coercion, force, are normal. It's normal in public life. It's normal in private life where you look at the relationship of, of a husband to his wives, you know, in terms of the, the uh, coercion, the force that is sanctified, of course, in the, in the Quran and so on against, against women, against wives. But what she was making the point about was she was afraid for America because this was this year she was speaking because America is getting to normalize terrorism to accept terrorism as as normal, just as moderate people within the Islamic world accept it as part of part and parcel of the power structure. So in other words, she was saying that we are starting to act like those she would call moderate Muslims within Islam, the people who actually aren't violent themselves, but they accept the system. They revere the system. They, in, they have internalized the system. And this is kind okay. of where she sees us. And that, to me, was one of the most profound comments I'd heard in a long time, but quite terrifying, because you do see it. We are normalizing it. I heard reports yesterday, I hope they're not true, that the federal government is, is advocating distributing tourniquets to public places to be as common as defibr defibrillators and other sorts of, of medical um, necessities. Tourniquets, as, as in meaning, we expect stadiums to blow up. Good thing to have tourniquets on hand in case we need to save lives. Now, someone would say, well, it's good to save lives, but do you realize what, we're, what the federal government is saying? They're saying they are expecting this and coping with it. And that, to me, is terrifying. Yeah, I was going to say, because I, because I reject that, um, I, I, I reject her, her, her position uh, just viscerally, just, you know, well, my, you my reaction is, no, 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 we're not doing that. But then when you say we're distributing tourniquets, it's like we're distributing heroin antidote into schools. Yes, and this exactly. Is, you're, you're, and so you're is, exactly correct, exactly. you know, I, and I, so now I don't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> well, think about airports. I would love to reject it. We've but normal, think about, yeah. Think at the airport. Yeah, that's right. We you have to take your shoes off, take your time. laptops out. Yep. you got to build in the extra time. And at what cost? You know, we're talking about bringing in all these, ref, quote, refugees, which, yeah. which you say, uh, you know, obviously they're not, they're not women and orphans. And, and frankly, if we are going to take in a bunch of young men, I don't think calling them women and orphans is going to make them feel good. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I have to point that out. And he called them three-year-old orphans. Uh, that, you know, that's mean. And he really should watch his language. Um, but we're, we're going to bring these people in at what cost? Because they go on welfare, they go on the public dole, uh, they, they cannot contribute to society because they are, they are not assimilated and they have no intention of assimilating because they're refugees. They just want to go back home. It is, it's, it's literally an act of suicide to be bringing these people in here. And with the added caveat that some of them might just want to blow us up, it, it, it boggles the mind. And you have to ask yourself, why did we wait this long? Why did we wait until there was a, an enormous, refu quote, refugee crisis? Why didn't we invite the Christians when they were being persecuted so heavily? The Yazidis, when they were being so heavily persecuted, why didn't we airlift all the Yazidis out and, and forcefully bring them into the United States, Mr. President? An excellent question. You're not going to get an answer, but you have to look at patterns of what has taken place. And you have to start to conclude that leader, the people in leadership positions, whether they were elected like a president or the head of Germany, or whether they are bureaucrats with great immense powers, for example, a man named Peter Sutherland at the United Nations who's in charge of uh, migration or refugees and so on, these people seem to have be on the same page in terms of inviting hostile slash aggressive slash impossible to assimilate populations from the third world, whether it be from the, from the east or from, from the south, into the west as a point of enforcing their visions of, quote, diversity, which means yeah. that the west can no longer exist as it has 
grown That's over right. millennia. That's right. Thanks so much for coming on, Diana West. You can go to dianawest.net to find out more and get her book, American Betrayal. It makes a great Christmas gift. I'll be right back after a break with Lenore Hawkins and Economy.